us and the good things he's done. Good evening, everyone. This is Jerry and Barbara, and we are so tickled that you would join us tonight. We ask you to open your Bibles to 1 John. Uh, that's toward the back, right in front of Revelation. And uh, we are just excited that you would join us tonight. We want to welcome the most important one to the meeting right now, the Holy Spirit, and ask that he reveal Jesus and reveal the Father to us like we have never, ever seen it before. So, Father, we just love you. We magnify you. We thank you for this good day. We thank you, Lord. You have guarded and protected us. You have provided for us. Father, you are our provision. You are our provision. You are our very life. Our breath comes from you. Everything that we need. But Lord, tonight we ask you for your presence. We ask you for your presence. We're not asking you for your protection, your provision, providence, your plan. Lord, we just ask you, Father, would you come and grace us and bless us and do what only you can do. Show us the Father. Show us Jesus. Reveal the word, the word, the word. Reveal the word. We studied last week that you are the one who reveals the mysteries of God. So come, we welcome you. We thank you. We thank you. Come now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So John chapter 1. Amen. So we are in 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. 1 John. Almost to Revelation, if you need to know the direction to turn, there's only, uh, it's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and then Revelation. So it's that close to the end of the Bible. And we've decided to jump over to 1 John because of the similarity and the things that John addresses in this book, similar to what Paul addressed in Romans. And so that's why we have decided to jump over here um, because it continues the theme that we've been talking about in Romans, in relationship, relationship, getting along with one another, get, knowing your position in Jesus Christ and, and loving others from that position. Since this is our first night with uh, First John, uh, we want to take the time to uh, give some history about the book, give some history about the author and where he was when he was writing this particular book compared to the gospel that he wrote. And then if we're lucky, I'm not sure we're even gonna, we may read 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, <laughs> but don't count on it. Because um, it's important to know who wrote it, who, who wrote the epistle, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where he wrote it, what was going on in his life, Yes. what was going on in the life of the audience that he was yes, writing in to, the community. Mm -hmm. and you know, what, um, and what does this mean to us today? Not only we look at the history, but how is this pertinent to us today? And it's important to know the audience, the author, and the situation it was written in. Well, that's what we're going to do so that we can understand John better. Rather than just, just jump right in and not know anything about the author. Yes, the, yes, uh, the Holy Spirit inspired it, but John wrote it down. And the inspiration came through his personality. It came through his vocabulary. It came so we need to recognize who the author was and what was going on in his life. Yes. So if you have my notes, I'm not going to read them, but I will um, take out some important sentences. So I'll try and tell you where I'm at in the 
in the document. Um, so we're going to start with the history, the history of First John. So when was Pentecost? Pentecost happened in 33 AD. 33 AD, between 30 AD and 33 AD, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. So the book of John, or I'm sorry, yeah, not the gospel, but the book of First John was written between 75 and 80 AD. So a whole decade, um, a whole generation, a whole generation passed the establishing of the church. Mm -hmm. So 40 years in the scripture is a generation. So this would be almost two generations. No, from 33 AD to 80 AD is okay. five to four, 45 to 50 years. Okay. Um, John at this time was probably the last living disciple of the original 12. And so thus he was also the oldest, unlike when they were together with Jesus walking the earth for those three years, he was the youngest. He was the baby of all the boys, of all the men, the disciples. He was the youngest of the group when Jesus walked the earth. Well, now here we have him as the oldest. He's lived the longest. He's, he's experienced more church development than the other disciples had experienced. And if you remember when he wrote the gospel of John, the theme was found at the very end of the book. It was found in chapter 20, verse 31. The whole reason he wrote the gospel of John was that these things that were written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So his point, in the gospel of John was that we would, we would believe in Jesus. The point of first John, the epistle is to establish faith and to prove that Jesus was of God, the deity and the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Jesus, and we'll is, get, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. And we'll get into the reasons why he had to establish this after 40 to 45 years, because remember the word when we talk in Romans divisions and heresies. Yeah. Whatever chapter that was in divisions and heresies. Well, a heresy had gotten into the church and he is trying to, his goal is to correct the heresy. Right. Or multiple heresies. So first John, so he wrote the gospel between 75 and 80 AD. First John, the book that we're getting ready to look at, was written between 85 and 90 AD. So 10 years later, 10 to 15 years later, and it was right before he was sent off to exile on the Isle of Patmos where he had the vision of the revelation. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the time period. So what was going on in that time period? Well, this letter, yes, sir. He is also written while he was living in the city of Ephesus. Correct. He was not in Jerusalem. And history, historians tell us that um, if you'll go back to the time of the cross, we will remember that Jesus said to John, John, the, John the beloved, the, behold your mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, historians tell us, and Barbara and I have had the privilege of actually visiting Ephesus, and there is the home of Mary, the beloved, Mary, Mag uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus in Ephesus, because John went to Ephesus and he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, mm -hmm. with him, and so, like Barbara said, that this epistle, this letter, was written in Ephesus before he went to was exiled to Patmos. And yes. if you if you'll see on um, the bottom of my first page, I give a reference to uh, Baker's Publishing Group 
and document these these references that uh, it also talks about Patmos and how tiny the island was. The island was only 21 square miles, a very small, tiny island in the uh, Aegean Sea, which is east of Greece. So um, it was a, the exile there, he wasn't in prison. It wasn't like he had a cover or a bed or a place to sleep. No, they just dropped him off on the island and, and and you had to fend for yourself. If you if you lived, you caught fish or you caught birds or something. You uh, there was no prison food, there was no prison water, there was no prison bed, nor shelter. Oh, it was a horrific, horrific exile. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I I, I hope he found a soccer ball. And painted the face on a soccer ball. <laughs> that's from that's from a movie. Sorry. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> so um <laughs> that was bad. I'm I'm blushing. <laughs> so 70 AD was when Jerusalem was destroyed. But okay. we have to, you know, it's a good thing to bring in comedy. Okay, Mark. So 70 AD we Jerusalem was was destroyed. And so this book is coming right after, mm -hmm. just very shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, I think it's and, important to talk about the migration. Okay. So in amongst all of the destruction of Jerusalem and different things that was going on, the Christians were being highly, highly persecuted right. by the Jewish people as well. And so in the second paragraph there, you'll see the word Johanna Epistle. Johanna Epistles, it's their nickname that I, we say first, second, third John. Well, those are John's epistles. So they are Johanna Epistles because they were the people when they left Jerusalem due to due to persecution, they went to a place in in uh, uh, in Asia Minor, where actually at that time it was southern Pakistan, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and some of the followers from Samaria, some of John the Baptist's followers, some of the Christians from Jerusalem, they kind of all started communing and making a community in this area of Palestine and then uh, what later becomes Asia Minor. And so this is really the group of people that John is writing to, but yet you'll see very quickly that it's not just to that one church. Uh, unlike, you know, in Revelations, he addresses spe seven, seven specific, church. specific churches. Um, and it includes the one in Asia Minor. Right, right. So, but these were people that were running for their lives and where they landed was heavy, was in an area of very heavy, Gentile, high paganism, religious culture. And so they went to this place looking for refuge, looking for a safe place to live and raise their family. But yet they landed in a very dark, satanic um situation really not even satanic it was religious and very high pagan worship mm -hmm. but yet the the division came into the church right. and we'll we'll get there so john if you as i mentioned earlier was the youngest of the disciples when they were walking the earth and he was also the one that jesus referred to as the beloved the beloved disciple John was the one that laid his head on Jesus's breast at the Last Supper. And so John is writing this letter from the aspect of his relationship with Jesus. That's very important to remember. He's writing from, an, from a position of being the disciple whom Jesus loved. That was his viewpoint of the gospel. That was the viewpoint of what he's writing here. I am the beloved of Jesus, and I'm going to write out of that heart, okay? 
And what an incredible position and perspective to write from, being loved, being loved. In contrast, when we were with Romans, Paul wrote his epistles because of his background from a perspective of warrior or a zealot or one who understood sacrifice, one who understood, and that's personal sacrifice because he was, he was in the army. He was, mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry, not an army. He, um, he, was, a, he, he was a Jewish a um, philosopher and lawyer. Thank you. Thank you. I, my brain went in. But he understood the sac the self sacrifice right. of those high demand positions. But he wrote Romans while he was in chains, and his visual visual in front of him was a Roman soldier. Yes, thank you. That that's that's very good. I, I yes. I rescued. You yes, you did. He also wrote from a perspective of discipline and authority, and that's right. why so much of his writings he will say. Um, uh, run the race or lay off every weight that so easily besets us. Because of the Olympics were there. That, and also um, he was a very strong warrior. He, he was, okay, I'm getting, Matthew wrote the, his gospel from a position of an accountant. He was very detailed. He liked numbers. He was black and white. There was very little room for gray areas. And Luke was a physician. So he wrote from uh, being emphasizing the human effects. Just about all of his miracles were on human beings, human healings, physical healings. And so where would your gospel be written from? What is your perspective? And where would you write from? What point of your redemption of Jesus Christ that he's saved you from, where would you be writing from? Let's remember in reading these different uh, gospels and epistles of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit did not remove the writer's personality and interest from them when they were inspired to write the word of God. Holy Spirit allowed that personality to come out in their writings. Mm -hmm. So. What has Christ done in you? What past experiences has Christ redeemed in your life and is using for the gospel's sake? What would your gospel story highlight? What part of Jesus would it be healing? Would it be grace? Would it be forgiveness? Would it be provision? Your Jehovah Jireh? What would your story highlight? The question still remains. From Matthew 16, 15, and Mark 8, Jesus is still asking us the question today, who do you say that I am? And from that perspective, your story in Jesus could grow and be shared to others from that perspective. Do you have anything to add? I do. Okay. I've been waiting for you to take a breath. You're doing such a good job. So, uh, John has several key words that he uses over and over again. And the, the word that he uses most repetitively is the word know, K-N-O-W, that you might know. Second one uses 33 times that you might know love. The third one, 15 times life. Know, love, life. Six times he uses the word light in reference to love and light, love and life. And four times what we're going to focus our study on through first John, second John and third John is the word fellowship. He uses the word fellowship four times. So it's, we begin even before we open the very first verse by looking at this repetition of and word selection. We understand that he is writing that we might know fellowship with light and love. So we can just kind of uh, track those words as we go through John. 
Go ahead. So from that position of love is where um, John was writing. And being loved is a powerful motivator. If you know you're loved unconditionally, love no matter who you are, you can do anything. You can really be very bold mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you know that you're loved. Mm -hmm. You're not worried of failure. You're not worried so much of, of not succeeding because you know you're loved. And so, and we love others as we have been loved. Apple. Go ahead. We have a grandson that uh, is, he, he looks than his sibling. He has curly hair and he is, is so obvious that he is loved and he is, he is treasured and, and, and a jewel. He is just the funniest, just, just a joy to be around. He is, he is not timid. He is bold. He is, I mean, he's not rude, but he is just, he is always laughing and giggling and, and doing his best to get other people laughing and giggling. Mm -hmm. And it is, out of the love relationship that his parents pour into him. They wanted him to understand that he may have been a surprise, but he was treasure. Mm -hmm. It may, he may have been a surprise in their life, but it was not an accident. And so we go back to the, the last chapter, the last lesson in Romans. We are not an accident. We are loved. We are thought he planned for us and uh -oh. don't know what happened, but you know, what's wrong? Uh, our screen went there something we go. else. Okay. okay. So Y'all great over here. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, anyway, so from a perspective of being loved, we can be all that God made us to be. From a perspective of being treasured, we have we don't need to be intimidated by anything or anybody. We can have the boldness of Christ Jesus. So John understood that as he abided in the love of the Father and the love of Jesus, he could just be bold in anything and everything. And that's that fellowship of the love of the Father is what he is doing his best to convey to us. John allowed Jesus to know him completely. And we cannot know Jesus' depth of love unless we're willing to face the fact that he knows us completely. Our pretend self that we try and put out there, maybe to others on Facebook or even to Jesus sometimes, is not who he loves. He doesn't love our, our pretend person, our masked person. He loves the sinner that we actually are. And so even with that love, how much easier is it to come to Jesus and to let him know us? And being aware of God's love <clears throat> is a great motivator for change and it frees us to really live. John had a brother uh, named James and in Mark 3 they were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. I really didn't think that was so important until I started looking at what he wrote about. <laughs> they were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder and I'm on page two in the second paragraph because of their weaknesses, we all have weaknesses, right? We all have weaknesses. John and James's weakness was demonstrating outburst of anger or outburst of selfishness. Remember when they wanted to call down thunder from heaven because they, the Samaritans wouldn't allow Jesus into their city. Synagogue. Well, yeah. so Jesus called them from there, the sons of thunder. Well, the Gospel of John, written by the same John, the Beloved, 
the beloved disciple, reveals the great love of God towards us. While Revelation, this is so good, written by the same author. Come on. But it reveals the burstings of the thunder of God's justice. So it's so interesting that here again is an example of how Jesus allowed that personality of John to come out in the inspired Holy Scriptures. He did not mask or make John pretend that he was something that he wasn't, right. but he used his personality to help demonstrate and help show the gospel in the epistles of Jesus Christ. So we get back to who do you say that I am? Who do you say Jesus is? Where has he delivered you? And what area are you able to minister out of? Because here John ministered out of the self-centeredness that God, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit delivered him from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want me to go on? I wish you would. You're doing such a fine job. Okay, let's talk about the text a little bit. I'm going to, it's kind of an overview of the whole book, okay? Um, First John is written about the vital aspects of faith. So his readers would know Christian truth from er error or heresy right. or incorrect teachings, false teachings. This was actually the first time that heresy and these false teachings was addressed in the ecclesia mm -hmm. called the way. Uh -huh. So this is the, the first time anybody steps up and says, uh, that's wrong, that's false teaching, that is of the Antichrist, and we have to uh, snuff this out, be, guard, be on guard against the lies that paganism would like to infuse into this radical new way of living. It had to be pure and it had to come directly from Jesus through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and John wants to make sure that there is no heresy, hallelujah, yes. to the gospel that we receive. There was no delusion. There was no false teaching. We receive the word from John who laid on Jesus' chest. Not just at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. This was not an unusual place for John. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, by the way, this is the John that Jesus said, uh, Peter, what concern is it to you if this one wants, if I say that this one's going to live forever? And then he was the last one of the apostles to die. <laughs> Hello. The same John. So here in the text, let's look at some of the heresies that John is writing to counteract these false teachings that are coming into the church. So remember, these people were vulnerable. They had left their home, right. trying to re be reestablished in another place. So, you know, when you're vulnerable, your mind grasps to anything sometimes that seems to be even a tad bit true mm -hmm. because you're, you're grasping, you're in a mode of survival, right, and right. it's hard to discern sometimes. So this book is going to, and it's only five chapters, y'all. It's not a big book, and the chapters are short. Right. Yeah. The chapters are very short. But here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven things that they were uh, addressing that the false teachers denied that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And so they denied that Jesus was of deity. They denied that Christ had come in the flesh. He was a good man, but it wasn't the Christ in the flesh. They denied the authority of Jesus' commands. He was just another person giving rules like other rabbis. Mm -hmm. They denied their own sinfulness. Okay, hang on just a second. <laughs> okay, so what they were teaching was that uh, Jesus came, 
but he was somehow not God and man at the same time that they were trying to separate and say that spirit is good and flesh is evil. And in such a way that he could not have come in the flesh because flesh is evil. And they came up with this just crazy, crazy explanations that Jesus did not suffer in his flesh. Well, he may have suffered, but it was, it was just an image. It was a holograph. It was a 3D <laughs> holograph. Of, and you could see him, you could talk to him, but it was a spirit. And John just blows all this up. He just really blows their, their teaching away, like in the first three verses. Yeah, he he jumps. He just immediately starts <laughs> jumping on these accusations and um, denying of the truth that um, they were presenting. They denied the salvation through the work of Christ. <clears throat> now, didn't we hammer that home in Romans? It's not what I do. It's not this Christ plus something else. And they were trying to deny that salvation came through the work of Christ. Um, they denied the absolute demand that bel believers would love one another or that there would be fellowship with God or their responsibility to live as Christ had lived. They because, denied the responsibility to live like their leader. Because they wanted to separate the flesh from the spirit. So if the flesh sinned, but the spirit didn't, so that's okay. But we know that faith without works is dead, according to Romans. So in our body, we, we are expected to, and John keeps hammering this over again, we are to live a life of righteousness because Christ is righteous. We are to live as disciples of the Most High, Jesus Christ, the perfect one. So they also taught that a person could be saved by a high spiritual and a high moral practice of self-denial, self, uh, uh, what's it? Mortification. Self-mortification. Thank you. Okay, you're um, so as I discipline myself, as I deny myself, as I, as I, I fast and sacrifice these things, these actions, would allow a person to gain a high level spiritual awareness and they call that so that they were adding to the work of christ is but we are saved by christ and christ alone in faith in him and his finished work on the cross and that goes that goes right along with uh, the third from the bottom in my notes they denied the nature of the company of believers as a community of fellowship with the father with the son and with one another mm -hmm. they didn't understand that a human being could have fellowship with the deity a spirit de deity right and so they could not wrap their brains around that so since they couldn't understand it instead of receiving it by faith they just said no y'all are all wrong right 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 so we understand that we are all triune beings that we are flesh and that we are soul and we are spirit and our flesh will die our soul and our personality and our spirit will live forever our our soul shapes the way our spirit responds so the they had a hard time understanding and grasping the triune Godhead or the relationship that we actually share. And that according to John, uh, uh, Genesis chapter three, that God made us in his image. Mm -hmm. We are three as he is three. Mm -hmm. So they, and, and the paganism, did not give them the insight. So one of the key words that John uses, that you might know, that you might know. So it's important 
that we have the knowledge given by the Holy Spirit, not book learning and not from false teachers. And, and you, to segue from what you said about John wanting to know, he expresses the evidence of our faith is measured by the genuineness of one's Christian lifestyle, not so much by what one knows. We can know a lot of things, but not live mm -hmm. as if we know it. We all do that. We all do, yeah. We all do that. We know way too much, but we're we, not living up to what we know. Be it in the scripture or be it in mathematics or be it in bookkeeping. I mean, we know things that we never put to use or live out. Right. We know we're all supposed to exercise, but who exercises? We know we're all supposed to eat right, but who eats right? Who eats right? So John is saying, don't just say, you know, show me by your lifestyle. So there's three areas and, and you can see it's broken down. It's going to cover the whole entire book, these three topics. John says the knowledge that God is light is tested by whether one walks in the light and obeys God's commandments. Well, he's using, he's using my key words. I mean, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So if you say you walk in the light, let's do it. Remember the end of Romans? Practice what you preach. We drove that home the other day. We have to practice what we preach. We have to do what we know to do is right. The knowledge that God is righteous, that head knowledge, is tested by whether one lives righteously as one born of God. We we put God to the test of righteousness. We, we, is prove, that, we, we prove, prove that God is righteous. Yes, by living righteously. By living righteously. And that we he, show forth the glory of God. And that he has done a righteous work in us. Yes. Yes. The knowledge that God is love is tested by whether one loves fellow believers, even as God loves us. I'm ready to go to John. I'm, I'm just itching. <laughs> Can you please just turn me loose? <laughs> okay. We've already stated the purpose of first John is to proclaim the, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, the son of God, the one who has come in the flesh and has overcome the world. He is the true God and eternal life. Hallelujah. And John opens up the first few verses of first John saying that he's seen him with his eyes. He's felt him with his hands and he has uh, handled him. He's handled, he's walked with him. He's done life with him. So go ahead. I know. I know. So there you go, baby. It's, it's all you now. No, no, you, you. no, I'm done. It's all you do oh, it. All right. I'm now, open the gateway for you. Oh uh, yeah. And stomped all around <laughs> in. Now, but you're a marker at first John and flip over to the book of John. Okay. Give me a thumbs up when you, you got- What chapter? John chapter one okay. and first John chapter one. Okay. Now, turn to the first page, Genesis chapter one, hallelujah. Genesis chapter one, listen to this y'all. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Verse three, God said, let there be light and there was light. God saw the light and it was good. Verse five, God said, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning was the first day. Okay over to John, the book of John, chapter one, gospel of John. Y'all ready? Byron, you there? In the beginning was the word. 
the word was what was spoken. God said, what did he say? He said the word. Mm -hmm. He said the word. And the word responded in action. The word brought forth light and life. God said, oh, that is so good. That is so good. John, the St. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. Okay, hallelujah. Turn to 1 John, verse one. That which was from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Are you connecting the dots yet? This is Christ the Messiah. This is the Son of God. This is the word that was spoken in the beginning that acted and brought forth action in Genesis chapter one. This is the same word. In the beginning, that, that which was from the beginning, which we heard. Now, you don't hear feelings. You don't, right. you don't, you don't hear thoughts. God said, and the word responded, that which we heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. That which was from the beginning, in our understanding of the linear dimension of eternity. Now, those two words don't go together. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. The linear dimension of eternity eternity jesus already was you see was does not exist in eternity there is no was and is and shall be it just it just is there's no was was what is for us to un that, that that's for our 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 linear concept of time and I keep going back to this, and y'all going to get a grip on this one day. But will you? I got it. I think you I got, did. You got it. And it, it excites me all the time that God invented eternity, and He was outside of eternity when He invented eternity. God has eternity in between the pinches of His fingers. He's got eternity. He was before eternity so to say in the beginning was the word he's he's bigger than that he's bigger than that he is bigger than eternity he invented eternity god has is always forever whatever you want to say but John is trying to get us to understand that which was from the beginning, the word. You see, to say that God is, is simply to our linear understanding. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. It encourages us to believe that the God of wisdom, the God of eternity, the God that is bigger. John 16, 27, or, or 25 through 27, encourage us to believe he's bigger than that. He's bigger than that. And he's waiting for you to let go of that that is hindering you, hallelujah. If you can just let go of those things that are in the way of you doing what God wants you to do, because he's bigger than that and he can heal you of that and He can, you can move past 
that that in our life and that that gets big and, and, and it's our, our excuse for, for not doing and not moving. But God is bigger than that. See, Mary was visited by an angel, angel Gabriel. And, and she said, well, how can that be? How can that be? And, and the angel said, Mary, don't you get it? Look, I just left God's presence to come and tell you this. And King James did a very poor translation. He said, King James says, don't you understand that there's nothing impossible for God? That's not what the Greek says. The Greek says, get this. The Greek says, don't you understand that there's nothing too wonderful for God? How don't God is bigger than that. That thing that's in the way that won't let you abide in his love and in his presence. John is trying to tell us here. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> What's the first word? That. That which came. That which came from the beginning. He's bigger. He's bigger. He is greater. He is infinitely wiser than any that you have in your life that gets in the way of you walking in the presence and abiding in the understanding that God so desperately loves you. Hallelujah. Oh, that's the first three words. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uh, five words. That was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have touched, and we have handled him, get this, 33 years, and we handled him for 40 days after the resurrection. See, if you turn uh, to Luke chapter 24, Starting around verse 36, it says that Jesus came through the door where they were, the, through the locked door, and they were sitting there eating. And they, they, they said, he said, look, 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 here's my hands. Look, guys, touch my hands, touch my hands. You see, the hole, the hole is still there. Oh. Hey, hey, y'all, look at them scars. Yeah, it's me. It's me. Put your hand. See, John was there. Mm -hmm. John not only laid his head on Jesus' chest regularly and rested on him at the Last Supper, but John was there. Peter, James, and John were in the room when Jesus walked in. It was he went to the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw. Come on and preach. He saw. He heard. He heard the voice come from heaven. It was with his ears, and he fell down and was sucking carpet. You could not convince. He was, he was there, and he's, he's telling us, listen, what part of the first letter didn't y'all get? I'm trying to tell you, I was there. I've told you this the first time. I'm telling you again. These guys are wrong. Mm -hmm. I handled him. I sat with him. I ate with him. I was there when the glory of his father spoke and said, I am so loved. I so love my son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John was there. Peter, James, and John. See, Look, 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 let's go back. That which was from the beginning, which we heard, not I heard. See, in the Old Testament, it says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let the truth be confirmed. Okay? So that's the, that's the, the, the legal principle. He said, which we heard. 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word, <laughs> that which was from the beginning, the word, concerning the word of life. Hallelujah. You see, John was not asking them to believe John. No, he said, we, we who? Well, how about Peter, James, and John? My brother, James. How about brother Peter? How about, you know, the, the disciples that walk with him? Listen, I was there. Even though they were dead, he still included them as eyewitnesses. Because this was after these other witnesses had written their testimony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew says in chapter 17, Mark says in, in uh, Mark 9, and oh man, we got to turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Okay, I get it right there. 2 Peter chapter 1. You, listen to this. For we, for we do not follow cunning, divisive fables when we were made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. Such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I will. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star shines in your hearts. Hallelujah. He's just asking us to, look guys, I was there. I put my hands on him. I handled him. I, 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 I gave him. I gave him bread. I gave him, and he took bread from my hand. I watched him eat the fish. I was, I was there. Can you just believe? Okay, so you doubt me. How about my brother, James? We, in the voice <coughs> of three witnesses, John is asking us, this verse two, grace, oh, Bible still in here. I'll fix the free verse. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. I can just hear Andrew saying, hey, hey guys, I have found the Messiah. I have found the Messiah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the one we've been praying for, the one we've been looking for. Come, Peter, come. John is saying this, Christ, Jesus, the manifest Messiah who existed before Eternity began before creation. He said, the life was manifested. When did life begin? Well, we talked about that. Genesis 1. In the beginning. In the beginning we go back to the first verse 1. John keeps repeating himself. I want you to know, he did not mind saying the same thing over and over. In the beginning, the life was manifested. <clears throat> We have seen and we have heard and we bear witness and declare to you. He just repeated what he said the first time. He said, he said, we have seen. In verse, verse one, he said, we have seen with our eyes. Verse two, we bear witness and declare to you what we have seen and heard. That, the, that, there it is again. That is bigger, is greater. That eternal life, which was with God, 
has been manifested to us. Hallelujah. So he's really tearing up these, these uh, teachings, false mm -hmm. teachings that did God come? Well, the angel said, uh, Emmanuel, God with us. You shall call his name. Isaiah said, you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So he's, he's tearing up the understanding and the teaching that God, that Jesus was God and that he did come and manifest in a human body, the manifestation of the incarnate God. We see this life was manifest. He says it again. He says it twice in the second verse and was manifested to us. Us. You see how he keeps using us. He didn't say me. Mm -hmm. That's right. He keeps saying us. It's plural. It is validation. All of us that believe. I believe it includes even today. Hallelujah. Those Amen. of us that believe, not just those in the past. Right. But he, John is including those yet to believe right. from that point. He's asking, will you believe? And can you receive the testimony of those who do believe us? So <clears throat> John repeats himself, but he asks, um, are you willing to share what you personally know? He's, John is going and, and laying it out all on the line. This is what I saw. This is what I know. This is what I experienced. You see, there's nothing more powerful than a personal testimony. You cannot deny. I shared last week uh, so much of my my early beginnings and the, the things that, that the I went beginning? through from the beginning. <laughs> and so you, no one can say no that that didn't happen. All the people that, that probably might say that they're all dead, so they, they're not going to say that. Uh, so. John is sharing the gospel from his perspective of love through his experiences. That's all God wants us to do is let the glory of the gospel of his grace, his, let his grace be demonstrated that we can give mercy to one another, that we can live if, if we can receive the grace of God in such a degree that we can show mercy to each other, we can be in fellowship and allow the glory of his love to be demonstrated. Amen. That is John. John says, I just want you to abide. Abide in his fellowship. And let his glory so shine through you that others want what you've got. Mm -hmm. The fellowship of each other, the strength, the covering, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, we thank you for coming and, and breaking this open in front of us. Let us see the eternal God. Let us see that the eternal majesty of your greatness came that we might see the Father, that you might make a way that we might share through your torn flesh and see the mercy and the grace and the, <coughs> and the nature of our Father and share in that. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen. That's, That's good preaching. I was going to tell you to keep going, Jerry. You're on a roll. I, 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 got, I, I got to give them something for next week. You know, I, got I know. To, you got I us got our mouth watering. Yeah. Amen. That was good preaching. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you. So if someone ends up watching this video, just know that you can go to deliverancerevolution.org. Deliverance Revolution just like the war.org. And there's a contact us button. 
You can ask us questions or we'll invite you to this group. Send us a message. Um, there's prayers on the website. There's a tab there that says prayers. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Some real good warfare prayers. So if you're interested in deliverance or just coming to this group or asking Barbara and Jerry a question, click the contact us. And we thank you for being here and we love you. And we'll see you next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God bless and have a great night. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Fling wide these gates, let's see his kingdom come.